So I watched these two new girls on the Atheist Experience. Viv LaBianca, I believe is her name. Yeah, it's an interesting name. If that's, I don't know if that's her actual name or it sounds like a stage name from like, like the 30s, like an exotic dancer from the 30s. It's a really cool name. I'm not sure if it's her actual name or not. And then Jen, Jenna Belk, I think is her name. And these are two new girls who are going to become in, who have been added to the rotation on the Atheist Experience. And uh, about a week or a week or so ago, they were on together. And this woman calls up. Now, here's something that maybe this has always been going on in the Atheist Experience, and I've just never noticed it before. Um, but this woman calls up, and she starts talking about this auditory, what she thinks was um, a voice t warning, giving her a warning. And they immediately, immediately, within three, 30 seconds of her talking, they start trying to walk her off her point. Now, like I said, Atheist Experience, they could have been doing this for years. I've been watching that show for years, and I watch about half of it almost every Sunday for the past year and a half. And it's only the last three months that I've started noticing that they all do this. As soon as you call up the show, within 30 seconds, if you're a theist of any type, polytheist, um, you know, regular Christian theist, Islam, whatever, if you're a theist of any type and you start trying to talk about what you, what you called up for, within a very short period of time, they are trying to walk you off your point, they're trying to contradict your point, they're trying to pull you away. Um, maybe they've been doing this the whole time. That's a strategy of obfuscation, just so everyone's clear. That is not a strategy of somebody confident in their position who's, who's, who is willing to listen and thoroughly hear what the other person has to say. Now, if you ask any of them, they'll tell you they've heard it all before and they know where it's going in bull. That's just not true. Maybe the only reason I've noticed it before is because I've actually been on a call-in show in the last couple of months on ACA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I swear to God. I think I'm the only Christian who has ever guest hosted a call-in show on the ACA. I guest hosted Truth Wanted with my, with my boy, Objectively Dan. Uh, I was there for, what, an hour and a half answering phone calls. And I know how, exactly how I handled phone calls, and I know how I handle people on my show, and I know how I handle people if I, honest to God, believe, like these girls might have, honest to God, believed that this woman was deluded, or at least that's what they said they believed. But if you honest to God believe somebody is deluded, you don't immediately start trying to walk them off their point. You don't immediately start trying to answer them. You really don't. I've talked to people in real life, in the actual, here in the real world, who I've thought, wow, this person is really not, you know, <laughs> they're not, they're a few sandwiches short of a picnic. They really just don't know what they're talking about. You know how much time I expend trying to walk them off their point? Zero, not one minute, not one ounce of energy. So it does not be speak. Atheists, in general, all of you can, can learn from this. Yeah, I'm trying to help you, atheists. I'm trying to help you be better atheists. Atheists gonna atheist. I accept that. I've said that before. Atheists gonna atheist. I accept that. But I want you to be better atheists. Good atheists don't start walking people off their points immediately. Why? It bespeaks lack of confidence in your own position. It bespeaks lack of confidence in your own position. If you are fully committed to the idea that you've gotten, that this person isn't going to be able to prove anything to you, then give them a fair hearing and let them speak. Give them a fair hearing and let them speak. Don't start trying to, you know, well, have you considered this right before they open their mouth? I've never done that. I've had atheists on my channel all the time. I never do that. Why? Because I'm 150% confident in my position. Hello? <laughs> Hello? That's why. So anyways, this woman starts talking about this, this auditory, let's say, fine, hallucination she had, or maybe it's some sort of, you know, spirit guide warning thing. I think that's what she thinks it was. Now, in this particular situation, the girl Jenna starts coming up with an alternative explanation. Her alternative explanation was 150% plausible and probably correct. And I agree with her assessment of what it was. So the woman's driving on a, on a road, and she's, it's late at night, and the, the, the voice tells her to do something specific, like turn your high beams on. Now Jenna immediately jumps to, but the only objection, I wasn't objecting to what Jenna theorized was actually going on, okay? I was objecting that she jumped to it right away, wouldn't let her really talk, wouldn't let her tell the second story either. They do this a lot. They do this a lot on Atheist Experience. Maybe they've been doing it the whole time. 
but I've only noticed it of recently because it's really starting to bother me. Everybody, every time now someone calls on their show, within 30 seconds they are, ch they are changing the subject. That is a strategy of obfuscation, whether you mean it to be or not. It's trying to confuse someone, walk them off their point, like make them not as clear about what they called in to say. It's, it's quasi-deliberate. It's quasi-deliberate. It really is. So anyways, I'm not objecting to her theorize. Okay, let's get this clear. The, the, the thing that she starts saying was possibility is perfectly reasonable and probably correct. It's late at night. You know, you, you might have seen, been in this situation a hundred times before. You might have seen something up in the road ahead, not noticed that you saw it. And, and you know, what you are experiencing as third party isn't necessarily third party. Maybe the radio was on and maybe it was some distortion of the sound and you sort of heard it as a voice telling you, but it wasn't really a voice. Or it's even, po we don't know our subconscious mind that well. It's even possible our subconscious mind might be able to literally tell us things. Literally voice. We don't know if that's a possibility. It could easily be. And this is what, the reason why this is, was in, of interest to me to begin with is that I've talked about this in videos in the past, I'm gonna talk about this in videos in the future. There is a strong correlation, a really close relationship between what people call spiritual experiences and actual experiences that can be fully accounted for in the natural, but occur along similar lines. As I tried to point out in some of my older videos, I have been in situations in my actual life, prior to being a Christian, where I have had intuitive, instinctual responses where it's almost as if my body and my mind started doing the right things in the situation in a si similar thing like this where, where it was actually life and death were at stake, you were actually potentially in harm or potentially going to get hurt if you didn't do the right thing. And, it was, and I experienced the third, third part. Now I didn't believe it was a being and I didn't believe it was God. I just noticed that I was doing things that I didn't consciously really know how to do. So it was like my body itself and my emotions and my, my, the entirety of my being was kind of responding to the situation like a supercomputer, and I was just kind of following it, following along. It's happened to me more than once. And if, if any of you think clearly about it, it's happened to you in your life too. This is not an uncommon thing. It's not uncommon what happened to this girl either. The only thing uncommon was that she actually thought she heard a voice tell her to turn on the high beams. What Jenna was arguing is perfectly valid. It may not have been an actual voice. You might have just thought it was. Perfectly valid. But there's a, there's a reason why I brought this up in the context of Christian apologetics. Because there, just like there is a strong correlation, like you are in a situation where there's potential danger to your body and person, your brain operates like a supercomputer in these moments. So, for example, one time I was in Manhattan and there was a, we were in a bar and we were surrounded by a, by a group of uh, <laughs> not altogether pleasant people. And there were about three of us, you know, 23-year-olds, 20, you know, obviously not tough people. And we were surrounded by people who were looking for trouble. And in that particular situation, I did all of the right things responded to the person 150% in the correct ways that if you ask any sort of criminal or street smart person or someone from prison, they will tell you exactly why I responded correctly. Oh, there's a whole series. I'll go into it in another video, the details. But I did things that I didn't necessarily know were correct. It's like my body took over in the moment to protect me and the people I was with. And it felt like third party. It didn't feel like God, but it felt like uh, almost like now do this. Now, now stand up. Now look him in the eye. Now, light a cigarette. And I did all these things correctly. Uh, I don't know if that made complete sense. So the, the, guys, the guys surrounded our table. Uh, I'll just, just in brief, the guys surrounded our table, and he, they were obviously looking to, to mess with us. And he, he grabbed my lighter. He asked me for a cigarette. I handed him a cigarette. He grabbed my lighter. I immediately grabbed my lighter back, stood up, lit a cigarette, looked him in the eye. Now that doesn't seem like it's all that important, but in this particular situation, everything I did was 150% correct, 150% intuitive, and really important. Really, really, every detail was important. If you talk to a street smart person or, or people who, have, who deal with dangerous people like that, they'll tell you exactly why it was 100% correct and important. And I didn't consciously know how to do it. 
grabbing the lighter back establishes ownership. If he had taken the lighter, put it in his pocket, they would have messed with us even further. Standing up, so now we're on equal playing field, looking him in the eye. I'm not afraid of you, even though I was. Even though I was, let's make that perfectly crystal clear. We were in a bar in Manhattan, we were surrounded by like six or seven guys, and they were looking for trouble. Believe me, this was terrifying. So I look him in the eye, which says, I'm not afraid of you. Immediately changes the power dynamic. We're in a lit, well-lit bar. Immediately changes the power dynamic. All of this is intuitively correct. I didn't know how to do any of this consciously. It was like my body took over in the moment. I experienced this as third party, not necessarily a voice saying, you know, look him in the eye. Craig, stand up. Craig, look him in the eye. I did this all intuitively. And what I, why I made the video is I was trying to point out is there's a strong correlation between in, in a dangerous situation, your body starts to take over and sometimes you do things that you do not consciously know how to do. And that information has been planted in you along the way in life and you don't know how you picked it up. Now, this, there's a very strong correlation between people who are really deeply intuitive. And I, in this video where I talked about in the past, I pointed out, for example, my wife. Same type of person, if I interviewed this girl who heard the voice, I bet you anything, I bet you $1,000 I'd pick, pick up the same basic type of personality as me or my wife or a lot of people who have situations like this. Very sensitive, very street smart, very intuitive, been through a lot. Been through a lot. Been through a lot. Understands the world is a lot more dangerous than most people understand the world as. Perceives the world as, you know, be careful out there. Bet you a thousand dollars this woman had. I, I bet you I could read her mail pretty easily as to what type of person she was, how she was raised. Then I get 80% of it correct. So where am I going with all of this? There is a correlation here that I was trying to point out. In Christianity, there's something known as the still, small voice. In other religious traditions, they have the same idea, the same basic idea. So what I was trying to do is, as a service to the atheists, start to explore some of the real world, you know, explore some of the real world ways to interpret some of these phenomena that we view as supernatural and relate them more closely to, in fact, natural phenomena. Kind of what Jenna was doing, except Jenna was doing it only strictly to debunk this girl. Not to actually understand the situation, truly account for it. To, she was just trying to write it off. So I don't have to b believe in fairy tales anymore. You know, in a, in, a, in a... By the way, just a quick aside on these two girls, okay? Um, they, you got... <laughs> If you're an atheist and you're watching this show, Atheist Experience, and you actually care about the, the future of the show going forward, you gotta you gotta write, you know, you gotta work on these two girls, I promise. You gotta you gotta write to the atheist experience, send them emails and tell them that they gotta get these girls, drill these girls, get them up to speed, because they don't know the they don't know the talking points the way the people in the past did. And I can promise you, they're, they're really, really shaky on a lot of this stuff. And uh, you get a halfway decent apologist, not even a good one. Like a halfway decent one, he will run circles around these girls. Even with this particular woman, they started to say things that were really unconvincing and it sounded like they didn't really know the script. You know, you know when atheists know the script. Extraordinary claims which are extraordinary proof. You know, they can, some of these atheists can, can repeat it in their, their sleep. These girls can't. She started saying stuff like, I've seen these documentaries on... Uh, I've seen all these documentaries on quantum mechanics and she starts trying to tie it into something. It's really unconvincing. You had a halfway decent apologist on there and he would run circles around her. Not a good apologist, a halfway decent one. So, you know, if you, if you just an observation, not, not criticizing them, they seem like perfectly decent human beings. My two objections to them, my main objection to them is they do what starting to become routine in the atheist experience. Someone calls up with a theist, uh, a Muslim, whatever. They start walking you off the point immediately. Again, atheists, think clearly. That does not bespeak confidence in the position at all. It bespeaks the opposite. If I am confident in my position, I let you speak. I let you talk. I let you tell me all the details before I even bother to try to debunk. They start debunking as soon as you open your mouth. Tells you something. Tells you more than you think it does. I promise you it does. But these two girls, I mean, there was a time, Matt Slick, I don't know if any of you know who Matt Slick is, he's only a halfway decent Christian apologist. 
Um, for a while, he was shopping around this version of the tag argument. Not a successful version of the tag argument, but I heard him because the first time he presented it was on Atheist Experience, and I, I forget if I either watched the show live or I just caught it on a YouTube video, but he's not that good of a, a Christian apologist. He almost ran circles around two of the two people on staff then. Matt Dillahunty wasn't there. It, was too, it may have been Dan Barker. I don't remember who he... But there was a period where he set the whole place into... into I swear to God, it was really fun to see. Because he set them off. He set off alarm bells at the atheist experience. They're like, oh my God, are we getting beat on air? Are we getting our clock cleaned on air? Someone proving God on air? And you could tell. And Matt did, eventually Matt Dillahunty came either back that Sunday or got in touch with Matt Slick. And eventually everybody... They, they even shopped in Alex Malpass to shut down his argument. His argument wasn't successful. But for a minute there, it looked like he was going to, he was going <laughs> to, you know, shut them down on air. And he's not that good of a Christian apologist. You get him with these two girls, he'll run circles around them. Honestly, honestly. It will be, it will be painful to watch. So, you know, words of the wise. If you care about your friends at the atheist experience, you care about, you know, protecting your, your dogma of atheism. You gotta, you gotta get someone to drill those girls a little better. Maybe, maybe that's how Tracy Harris and Matt started out. I don't know. I, I, I started watching them maybe four years ago, so I have no idea. Maybe they were really awkward in, at the beginning and didn't know what they were doing quite yet either. So maybe there's a, there's a learning process involved, and maybe they'll within a couple months they'll be up to speed. I'm just saying right now, you know, <laughs> if there's a decent Christian apologist, and it's not my agenda. You know, I'm not in the business of just trying to win debates with atheists. If I were, I'd be handling this a lot differently. I honestly don't care. But you, you got a, I got a, I got a handful. I got, I know about 50 Christian apologists who aren't that great who could easily win debates with those two. Easily run circles around them. Easily, they don't really know the same talking points that everybody else has down pretty cold. Maybe you know she's only been an atheist for a couple months, so you know maybe it takes a while. So might not be a real thing. So anywho. There's a whole conversation here, and this is just, again, I'm just throwing this out there just for public consumption, make of it what you will. I will be talking about this correlation between um, what I call a deeply, like a, an intuition, an instinctual experience like this woman had, and a spiritual experience. You will find that those experiences correlate consistently and constantly. Like when I've had experiences that I was in a dangerous situation and I maneuvered out of the danger with no actual input from my conscious being, like I didn't know how to get out of it, just seemed like I, like, you know, knowledge started entering me. I experienced it all the time as third party. Did not think it was supernatural, but I knew it was, I was, my subconscious was taking over. And any of you, if you think about those experiences, Think about them now. You've had them in your life. Think of the time where you were in danger in your life, where there was a situation where you might not have gotten out of it. And, you know, lo and behold, you, you, you had this, this quick flash of insight. It's like, do this, do that, do this, do that. It's happened to almost everybody. It's a common thing. You can go look it up on, on Google if you don't believe me. You know, all of a sudden you go, something told me to open the door. So you open the door and now you're safe. Happens a lot. A lot of people correlate that in their own experience with the voice of God. It's direct. There's a direct corollary. I'm not saying that it is a voice of God. I'm not saying it proves a voice of God. I'm saying it is worth exploring because it is batting around in the same basic area. So that's why that particular conversation was of interest to me. And it was noteworthy. I do not necessarily know if that girl... I don't know. Uh, Jenna's, Jenna's, Jenna's point of view on what happened to that girl was probably where I'd fall in my guess. That it was her subconscious mind and it sounded like a voice. Maybe. Uh, do I think an angel or something literally helped her? Mm, probably not. But I'm not so convinced of it, you know, that we got to talk her out of it. <laughs> I've got to talk you out of it quick. Couldn't have couldn't been that. Couldn't have been that. No way, no way. I wouldn't, wouldn't even come close to, have got, you know, trying to handle it that way. So, that is all for now, kids. Just thought that was noteworthy. Um, that is all for today. Amen. Um.